we're going to move to our next speaker, who is Dr. Claudia Gamundi. Claudia is a palliative care physician who works as clinical director at the Palliative and Supportive Care Clinic of the Oncology Institute of Southern Switzerland. And that uh, institute cares for over 1,200 patients every year. <coughs> Claudia has her master's degree in palliative care and, and is completing her doctoral studies at Lancaster University. Oh, nearly nice. there. Nearly, nearly there, I know, nearly there. Her research interests are, include families and assisted dying, symptom control and education in palliative care. Uh, Claudia is currently chair of the task force for education of Palliative Suisse, uh, the Swiss Society of Palliative Care. And I know from my friendship over the years with Claudia that she has extensive experience in postgraduate education in both general and specialist palliative care. And because of her work developing the competences for palliative care with the European Association of Palliative Care, we were um, grateful that uh, Claudia acted as the external reviewer for the Irish Palliative Care Competence Framework that was published in, to, in 2014. And Claudia's presentation today addresses the topic of palliative care education, competence and confidence. Thank Thanks, you. Claudia. Thank you. So thank you very much to everybody. Thank you very much for having invited me. It's always a pleasure to come to Dublin and Ireland um, and, uh, uh, and meeting people and discussing issues because uh, I actually come from uh, uh, a Swiss background uh, in which education and research have similar challenges and also different challenges. And, uh, um, and coming to other countries and spread some knowledge and discuss with you um, our experience is very enriching for, uh, but for me personally, but I think also for the experience of palliative care education. My um, topic, uh, I, I need my slide, so my topic is, uh, um, yeah, we talk about palliative care education, go through uh, some basics uh, of what is a competence uh, and all these basic issues because I think that by reminding some basic concepts uh, we can then go back to some more in-depth uh, uh, reflection. And uh, I want to spend time on future challenges and developments of palliative care education uh, because uh, as much as research is important, uh, education is important and not only for us as specialists. Um, this is the spread that has been done in the, for palliative care in the world. And it's huge. It's, huge. it's uh, the, the yellows and, uh, and um, orange uh, that you, uh, we don't know, but all the green and the slight stones of greens are uh, advanced integration or preliminary integration. So as you see, it's a worldwide uh, um, philosophy of care that has been spread. And all these, uh, um, well, I just PC ranking for palliative care development uh, just to tell you that you are in a very good position where actually us in Switzerland, we're not even in the <laughs> EU community, so they can't rank us. But actually, you are uh, in, in very good position and uh, United Kingdom uh, with Belgium and Netherlands, uh, Sweden and Ireland are the first five tops uh, for uh, providing uh, palliative care, which you should be proud of uh, being in, uh, in that position. Um, but still, it there are lots of myths about palliative care. I don't know if this talks to you. This talks very much to me in Switzerland, talks very much to me when I go back in my country, which is Italy. Um, mm, all my friends uh, say, oh, Claudia, I'm so, oh, you just care for the dying. Uh, so sorry, so sad. <laughs> so they don't appreciate uh, the, the, the concept uh, of, in, of early palliative care, or not just care of the dying. Uh, they just think that we are there for the last five days uh, of, uh, of the patients. Uh, oh, Claudia, always pain. You, you, you have to give a lot of morphine to your patients. Uh, this is another myth. Well, we give a lot of morphine but not only, <laughs> but pain management, comparing um, palliative care with just pain is very, very usual. And uh, it's uh, this, uh, we, we say nihilism of palliative care. So where it, when there is no more things to do, then it's come time for palliative care. We don't have any more to do, and this is uh, when palliative care comes. Why I'm saying all this to you? Because these uh, are the myths uh, that are already present for palliative care in many countries uh, and in many people. 
options in many nurses, but in patients and families. And how we can overcome this? Of course, there is research, but there is also education for doing this. And that's why um, we need to really focus on education issues. Why and how we provide care? You know this very well, but again, uh, going back to the basics, uh, then we can reflect more about how we develop educational programs. So we have uh, all the patients, the primary level palliative care patients, uh, which are there for GP, teams, uh, home, hospital, nursing. Then we have this middle class uh, that, uh, of patients uh, which require palliative care, sometimes require specialist advice. These are complex <coughs> patients that then, with a specialist advice, can go back into community. There are some levels of complexity that then, by having had uh, some good palliative care, specialist palliative care advice, that they can be treated again by community, <coughs> primary care. And then we have these highly complex, instable patients uh, that need to be treated in specialist places by highly educated nurses, uh, physicians, uh, and all the interdisciplinary team. This is th these patients have a low probability to go back <coughs> just to community. Very often to my experience, uh, they, they stay here and they die here because uh, they remain complex patients with multidimensional needs uh, that actually in the community are not, uh, uh, the community education is not enough for um, um, responding to their needs. By s in Switzerland, we said A patient, we say the general palliative care and then specialist palliative care, which is uh, about the, the same ARPC model. If you see here, uh, Turning into clinical, uh, turning to clinical into education, we can say that then by teaching palliative care, we have to address at these three levels. The ARPC has addressed this very well. So we have a palliative care approach, uh, all stuff uh, to have education in a palliative care approach, uh, but in a undergraduate and also postgraduate level and all professions is not only nursing or physicians uh, but we have physiotherapists here we have logo uh, speech therapists uh, we have uh, social workers there involved so palliative care approach in an undergraduate setting is really important uh, to give uh, the basics uh, for these patients community patients uh, who will need uh, a palliative approach. Then we have the general <coughs> palliative care level, which is provided again by primary care professionals and, even, and eventually specialists treating patients with life-threatening disease. And they need to have good basic palliative care skills and knowledge. Okay? So this is depending on countries, uh, because it depends how well people are educated, because the, the more educated we have the primary care teams, the less we need a specialist palliative care, then we can say that this one in two are, can raise up to 60 or 70% of the patients that can and should be treated in, in these settings. But if you have this setting that needs improvement in their education and their competence, then we will see why you need more specialist palliative care. So normally uh, in establishing in a country a palliative care, uh, they, in example, they gave a lot of importance to specialist palliative care because they had none in, pal in primary palliative care, in none in knowledge, none in, res in research and in services. We are very much improving this level and then we expect to, to a, a bit go down in the need of specialist palliative care. So this is uh, how we should educate people in different levels for palliative care. Just a reminder, 
use uh, competency, the concept of competency to educate people because it's a very practical way to establish different levels, uh, domains uh, and uh, competencies uh, for um, the people. Just to rem um, we have developed this which means competency of specialist palliative care in Switzerland we did between 2000 and uh, let's say 6 and 12 about it took six years uh, for us to go through all this uh, many many stories <laughs> I can tell uh, well I, I, I think the master <laughs> um, they have a, a kind of similar we, we end up uh, in similar reflections and similar competency uh, in uh, um, in the in the development of uh, a strategy for palliative care education <coughs> let's go back what is a competence it is uh, the skills the knowledge the experience and the attributes uh, and behaviors that, that is required by a certain individual in order to uh, perform an activity okay this is a competence but we it's important to remember that the core co the core components are the knowledge the skills and the behavior and the attitude and I will stress the importance of the attitude in the next slides because I think it's crucial I think that to to work on the myths of palliative care we need to work on people's attitudes and we need to know what are the, their attitudes uh, and we need to be capable of changing their attitudes. This is uh, the core skills of the palliative care nursing, as you see, just for as an example, I can't put knowledge because it's just in a list of uh, pain and uh, you know, psychosocial issues you will see it here. Uh, so uh, ARPC developed uh, the, an, a, a very nice collaboration with Sheila and, uh, and, the, um, and the group uh, that helped us develop the core competencies for uh, interdisciplinary uh, levels of general palliative care. As you can see, you s uh, we go through these 10 competencies, which are the basics uh, for knowing what palliative care is, uh, working on the physical comfort, psychosocial need, uh, social needs, spiritual needs, uh, family, ethical decision making, a coordination and interdisciplinary, the communication skills uh, and the self-awareness. Uh, this is what we developed in Switzerland, uh, reflecting upon interdisciplinary core competencies. So what is common between us, uh, not only us, but also primary care, so general palliative care. You can see um, it's in French. I couldn't, it's just an image, so I couldn't just translate everything. But this is the bio uh, part, the psycho, the social, and the spiritual uh, parts, the components of the care. These are the list uh, of the possible professions involved in palliative care. You see the nurses, uh, physicians, physiotherapy, ergo, social workers, activity, ergotherapist, uh, a dietitian, logo, etc. And you will see how they are involved, that their competency are involved in the physical sphere, psychosphere, social sphere, and spiritual feel, field. You see that for sure, for example, the aumonier, which is the chaplain, has a very thick line into spiritual, but it has actually a line also in the psycho in the psychological needs of the patients and also in the social needs. So that, that is the big challenge, uh, which is the overlapping of competency of the interdisciplinary team, which is, uh, we, which is a, a, a high level overlapping comp basic competency, while actually every profession that needs uh, to be very competent, uh, for example, the <coughs> you see here in the mm, in the physical parts or, or in their own field of capacity. How the competency is constructed, you see that we put together to be competent, we need to put together knowledge, we need to put together <laughs> the skills uh, and also the attitudes. Uh, and on the other part, uh, we need to put together actually 
the basic knowledge, then we need to transfer <coughs> this into practice, into the application of what we have learned. Then we need to show our capacity, so we demonstrate uh, the, how, what we have learned, and then we need to do it uh, as a professional. Okay, so this is the complex uh, uh, constitution of uh, how a competency is uh, assessed uh, in, uh, in, in practice. We need to finally be able to do it, to do it, but there is uh, much more behind what we just do. And sometimes, uh, you know, I, I, can, I can reach you in the busy day life uh, how important it is uh, to maintain the capacity to go back uh, every time I perform a task, uh, to go back uh, to what is my knowledge, uh, how I do this, uh, and how I make uh, this task. <coughs> is there a, then we, go, we, will, we will have a moment uh, where we will reflect on the confidence we need to be confident in what we do, and by being confident, we need to be aware of this. So we need to know why we do these things, what are the basics of what we do. What are the future challenges? We have done a lot in palliative care education. I could have told you more, m many more slides about what have been done, a list of things. Uh, basically, I went back to research and we would need a systematic review. I throw this to Sonia. We would need a systematic review because I couldn't find my answer is uh, do people well educated then provide better care for patients? We still don't have an answer. We still believe that highly educated provide better care but we don't know, we, we have no demonstration of this, and actually we don't have uh, also the patient's point of view. Because we perceive that we are highly educated, so we provide a better care, but actually we don't ask our patients if this is true and if this is perceived by them or not. So um, we, we should need to, to, to do some more research about actually outcomes of education because uh, what what I'm going through now is that the future developments and when I think in terms of resources this is uh, if we prior uh, prioritize uh, these uh, um, these um, these tasks uh, they need money they need money to be prior prioritized they need time, they need professionals, uh, and before starting all this, we need to know if there is an impact uh, on patient's care and not only on professional satisfaction. Because all of you that have done a, high, a, a master course or a PhD, we all are very proud and we think we are more capable, but uh, um, this is a self-perception. It is a sure of this. Uh, but it's not enough, like Sonia told us before, to ask money in these periods of time. So we need to be sure that this is, uh, that, that all this has an impact on patients' life and needs. Let's go through these. Uh, diffusion of undergraduate education in palliative care. I think this is one of the crucial things, uh, and I don't know how well is placed Ireland in this. Uh, Again, I couldn't find a proper review of European undergraduate education. There is an APC task force. I'm talking to the president now. But it's all, it's medical education. It's undergraduate medical education. And uh, what about the other professions? Uh, we, we say we are interprofessional. We actually are. How do we teach um, palliative care in undergraduate? We actually don't, don't have a clear, I think, uh, at least internationally. We have the problem, uh, and I think this is a, a, an important resource, interprofessional education <coughs> for collaborative practice. This is a teaching. We will go through this. There comes some in the future palliative care. And we need, I think, a, a, 
we, we have urgency in new competencies for new clinical scenarios. We went through, Michael, you were talking about cancer care and non-cancer care. I think we need to be much more competent in non-cancer that we so let's, let's have a look in the pre-grad. Pre-grad, we have this nice paper. Of, uh, he looked to the, the graduate palliative care education. Does it influence the clinical patient care? And it's very frustrating. In the literature, only indirect evidence was found supporting the palliative care training at university leads to better clinical care of patients. So at the moment, what, what we know about Carlos is that uh, there is indirect evidence. So this is frustrating because I think that we need to push much harder the undergraduate education while we don't have enough evidence uh, when we go to the deans uh, and to uh, university to push this. Uh, so this could be the result of the fact that is, uh, there, there are few published literature about undergraduate education and impact. Uh, so it's, it's an under-research topic. Uh, and so the indirect evidence comes uh, from an indirect, uh, um, sorry, no, comes uh, to a low prioritization of uh, undergraduate education outcomes research. And, and, but it is an indirect uh, that in, uh, in the US, uh, they have this uh, new competency and recommendation for educating undergraduate nursing students to improve palliative care. This is a very important uh, piece of paper. You can find it if you Google this. Uh, you uh, just to tell you that uh, it's not only for physicians, it's not only for nursing now, but what about the other professions? So we need to think about the other professions uh, to be educated in palliative care in undergraduate to provide better, hopefully, better care for uh, the primary care uh, that patients need. Another critical area for uh, the development of education is the concept of collaborative practice. We are talking very much about the interdisciplinary of palliative care, but the key aspect is we need to learn together to be more capable of work together in the future. Because uh, when I went to the university, we were all medical students. We never met a nurse student, never ever. We met nurses when we came to the, gra to the, to the wards, uh, and then we say, oh, wow, there's a nurse there. Oh, wow, there's, there's a physiotherapist. Uh, we haven't learned together. We discovered that actually we were learning some overlapping competencies, some not overlapping competencies, that nurses have a completely different vision of the care and all these issues compared with a physician. And by educating people in different settings and not putting them together, then they will be put together in working in the practice and there will be challenges. I don't know in Ireland, but I educate a lot of nurses in undergraduate and postgraduate, and I hear so much frustration by nurses uh, toward the physicians. Uh, they don't prescribe enough. Uh, they don't know about suffering. They don't recognize the suffering. I don't know. I see some smiling faces, so I think we face some common challenges. And, uh, they don't give you rescue doses, uh, for example. They don't prescribe rescue doses. Uh, so there is a highly high level of uh, nurse impotency uh, in, in home care, for example. They need rescue doses uh, for, to teach families uh, to, pro to, to give to the patients uh, in the middle of the night, uh, and physicians don't even prescribe. But this is the result uh, of not, uh, not being educated together. So, the old uh, interprofessional education is about uh, preparing health professionals for deliberately working together to provide highly high quality. This is not proved, but at least it's proven and it's evident that we need to work together. <laughs> so we need to learn together. There are evidence. I think here, for example, this paper about enhancing interprofessional Reflections of done in, of the literature 
together medical nursing, bachelor of health science and chaplaincy students. We are trying to do this, for example, in the University of Lausanne. We are putting together also in Geneva. Uh, for example, in Italy, I have no clue of any course uh, that has been done interprofessionally. So this is a pity and this is a priority for the future. This is another example just to, for you if you want some uh, more um, um, there is in the in, in the slides. Um, another important area is uh, the overcoming barriers to access uh, palliative care by modifying attitudes of professionals. We know, if we go back to the competency, we know also that there is a taxonomy. We can teach pain at different levels uh, with a different taxonomy, which means uh, here we give a general education about, for example, pain <coughs> control. We go more in depth for the uh, primary palliative care and then we really know all about methadone and ketamine and all these issues uh, here in the specialist level. Is this enough? I don't think this is enough for ever overcoming any barrier. Because, because there is more than just knowing more. There is more because there is this piece of attitude that, that changes and can change everything. Because we can take a GP and teach him about methadone and ketamine and all this, but he will never recognize, for example, complex pain because there is no attitude in recognizing this. By teaching, for example, methods, we will not improve, I think, a lot. Why? Why? Because, for example, if we are teaching how to do an injection, we teach what, so we need to, for the intramuscular, subcut, intradermal, whatever, there is a technique, but there is a how we do it, okay? We can give you an injection, I can come to a patient, inject, move away. I can come, sit down, smile, inject, go away. I can come, sit down, explain, inject, and go away, okay? These are attitudes. So the competency, the result of more than just an attitude, but how can we teach the nurse, the physician to sit down, to talk to people, for example, it's so about, you see, it's all about techniques are not the most difficult to teach. Technique is easy. You take a mannequin and you make the nurse inject a hundred times until she learns. Easy. It's the attitude that, that are much more important and much more difficult to teach. Basically, we will go back to the learning pyramid, but uh, it's about uh, teaching how we learn how we learn, and this is also related to an attitude. I can't teach you an attitude today with my lecture. No way. But by doing it with you, I can teach you my attitude. We can, we can modify together our attitude, working together. This is the most powerful um, learning tools that we have. Discussion, practice together, and in, in the sense of, uh, you know, lecture, teaching by doing together. So this is valid also for the, uh, attitudes. It's not on perfection. Why do I say all this? Because uh, what are the attitudes of professionals in palliative care? I found nothing. I tried Google Scholar, dirty and quick. I tried uh, some uh, very <laughs> medical... <laughs> Um, and genes, perhaps if I would go to PsychInfo or CINAHL, I will find more. But basically, as a physician, I'm only a physician, I look in, <laughs> in PubMed. And this was the good paper, but only one exploring core attitudes. And it is said that it's for professionals, but actually all these people interviewed nurses. And this is the really nice result. What are the attitudes for palliative care specialist professionals? 
And if you see these are, yes, they are attitudes, but uh, they are also values uh, that we have. So it's very easy to teach attitudes to these people because they are already there. Easy, easy job. You know, if I talk to you about uh, empathy, okay, it's not even there. What <laughs> <laughs> if we talk about uh, letting go, oh, it, we can spend hours on this, uh, but you know what I mean, I know what you mean, and yes, uh, we will become better in knowing how to let go, but we, we start from a very high level. But if you go back to the GP about letting go, he knows nothing and he has no attitude, okay? So that is the challenge, uh, is going where these attitudes are not there and how do we put some seed for these attitudes? How do we do? <laughs> First of all, we need to know what an attitude <coughs> is. It's a predisposition, a tendency to respond positively or negatively towards a certain idea, project, or situation. And attitudes actually are super powerful stuff because they influence and they guide what we do, why we do, and how we react, how people and motivate or not motivate them. Aristotle, some years ago, a few years, he was saying that edu educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. So by just teaching nurses and physicians how to inject, uh, it means nothing. When I went to the university, they said, oh, Claudia, you come from classical studies and to, you go to a scientific university. And I said, do you think a scientific university is treating people? I think it's very s human, absolutely, is, uh, is, uh, is not, uh, yes, it is a science, uh, but is uh, social sciences. And I spent six years of university debating this with my professors, and actually they were believing that they were teaching science, uh, and I was believing that I was providing and pro proceeding in my classical studies, uh, and I'm still convinced of this. Treating people is a science, yes, but it becomes an art. So we need to go to, this, uh, to, to the heart of these uh, attitudes, uh, because we finally we will work with people. So our attitudes can affect uh, components. Uh, so how we feel emotions? Uh, of course we, are, we care for the dying, uh, because uh, we have that kind of attitude that brings us together. But how do we teach this to other people? The cognitive, so the opinion, you know, the needs, uh, the very early slide, uh, needs of palliative care, just care of the dying, this is a belief uh, that is guided and is the result of an attitude. The cognitive, the inclination for action, again, comes from an, from an attitude that we have. If we decide to do something or if we decide not to do, comes from an attitude. Evaluative, so the response to the stimulus uh, is also a result of an attitude. It's, it, it is, I think, in the future, it's crucial to continue to teach about methadone and ketamine, but we need to have more than this. Because barriers, if we go to barriers to palliative care and education should overcome barriers. It's not only educating people who are to be educated, but it's reaching people where in a place we don't like because they, we don't agree. universal uh, slide, but the people, the physicians, and they, they analyzed all the barriers, and they say, for example, true, don't the attitude to the possibility will die, I will never be good in prognostication. It's not about technical issues, it's about the capacity of dying into the care and it's not uh, technique you can teach the child 
morbidity index, we can teach all these issues. But if we don't keep in mind that you have to include the possibility of death to these patients, uh, well, they will never see. You don't see what you don't see. You don't know what you don't know. They may not recognize how much the patient is uh, suffering. Physicians of are bad people. They, are n they don't have the attitude to suffering. Some of them are welcome. They, we become palliative care physicians. Easy. But how do we teach a neurosurgeon to include for their glioblastoma or uh, you know, hemorrhagic brain hemorrhage patients? Uh, how do we teach to include, to watch their suffering and include the, only the term suffering into their speech? Attitude. The lack of communication skills uh, to address end of life issues. In, in Ticino, in the Italian speaking part, they're trying to teach physicians how to better communicate. They want to have techniques. So, Claudia, you're so good to talk about dying. How do you do? Let's make this ball and play this. Can you play this with me? And I say, yes, we can play. Why do you lack communication? Why are you 50 year old and this is the first time in your life that you ask yourself, uh, am I a communicator about end of life? Because you fear, like everybody of us, exposing the patient to this type of communication. Well, it is ethical to give the patients the options. Attitude that this is an option. So if Bookman, uh, six uh, steps uh, for breaking bad news, uh, you can do it perfectly in, in empathy, anything. You can just be a mechanic of good, of good communication or good relation. You know what I mean, you see? It's all about attitudes. I misunderstand something, yes, but when I realize that I misunderstand, why or why there is no way of misinterpreting what you're saying? Because I'm not thinking wrong, I'm thinking to my And we can go on and on and on. For example, this is amazing. This is some, I, still, I still face uh, this phrase in my mobile team activity. I go to the hematologist. Uh, I had a huge discussion with my with uh, my onco hematology colleague and finally he said to me, Claudia, I don't believe that palliative care is important for my patients. Mm. So how do you start from there? <laughs> it's all about attitudes. It's all about attitudes. It not losing you know, wisdom, and it's all about attitudes. But he doesn't believe, and I said, well, you, I believe in religion, perhaps uh, we believe in God, we believe in something, but palliative care is a medicine. It's the same that you say, I don't believe in surgery. And he starts saying that palliative care, is it a medicine? Is it a type of medicine? So, you know, the, and he's not providing palliative care to these patients. And when I come to my five days in Dublin clinical placement <laughs> in the hospice and I went uh, in the mobile team and I discussed uh, with them, they had the same issues with the hematologist, the onco-hematologist, same problems. Exactly. So, so, we have a weapon. I think we have a powerful weapon, which is education, but we need to be smart in providing an education that people can listen to. And it's not teaching them things, because when they realize that they are taught, they stop listening. This is an amazing piece of research, and again, research is so helpful to reflect also in, in fields outside, edu inside education, even if this research has nothing to do in education as a name, but I can use it very much. They, what, the, what have they done? They have done uh, an evaluation uh, of uh, the capacity of training care workers in spiritual and existential care for a dying 
done from a mobile hospice nurse teaching team. Okay, so how do mobile teams uh, teach um, these uh, very complex uh, um, spiritual and existential care issues? If you read, and I'm sorry, but qu reporting qualitative research in, in slides is quite complex, is, is wordy, and they say you don't have to put too many words in slides, but I, I have no <laughs> good <laughs> solution for this. They were talking about fear and uncertainty. Care workers often expressed they felt reluctant to address dying patients' existential and spiritual suffering. Mobile say that a care worker could be quite afraid of talking with patients about blah, blah, blah. You see, <coughs> this is all about attitudes again. Mm -hmm. Because fear and uncertainty is not knowledge and it's not a skill, you see? But yes, but there is also a lot of healing in sharing the silence. So I try to show them how important that it is. But it's really hard for some because they are so scared of being with a dying that they try to avoid staying in the room with them. How can we use mobile, for example, teams uh, to help these teams, uh, primary care teams, uh, to stay there safely for themselves uh, and for their patients? They were talking about holistic hospice values uh, and the mobile teaching team strove to teach care works to work from the heart, uh, emphasizing relational aspect of caring. And again, the conclusion is uh, bedside teaching. If you go back to my slides, the pyramid, I'm sorry because it makes a little bit people sick to go past uh, backwater, but you see, it's again, we place everything here, working with people. We need to acquire competency to talk with people and work with them, starting from their point of view and trying to understand who they are. We are very good with patients. We need to be as good as with our colleagues that don't listen or that we believe they don't listen. I am doing a lot of research, but also clinical work uh, on assisted dying requests. And I know very well how palliative care, some palliative care believes uh, about assisted dying, but actually it is about starting from the patient's needs and the primary care people caring for them, understanding what are the challenges and trying to address those values. But I don't need to say, you are doing wrong, uh, you need to do it in another way. I need to understand why they are doing this, uh, whatever they are doing, and try to overcome uh, this behavior. But the behavior is the result of the attitude, and I can change the attitude only by working together. It's not about giving lectures only. <coughs> how we can change the attitudes uh, or values uh, because aim of education is the knowledge, not of facts, uh, but of values, as you see. We have to provide new information. This again goes back to Sonia's work, the spread of the information, the spread of research results, uh, the spread of the evidence that we have. It's important to make people understand uh, that perhaps uh, they hold old knowledge, that they need to be updated. We need to, um, to do this. And insufficient, we have to know that insufficient information is the cause of negative attitudes. For example, for example, um, I heard a lot of nurses and physicians telling patients, uh, asking for assisted suicide in Switzerland, where they we it's provided uh, oh but you know think about your family how bad they will be after and i'm doing my phd on family experiences of assisted dying uh, and <coughs> believe me or not my systematic review that i am really struggling to conclude <laughs> <laughs> um, concludes that there is no evidence uh, for 
just concluded that people struggle after assisted dying. There, are, there is evidence that say that people are very well, and there is evidence that say that people struggle with some issues about post-traumatic stress disorders. But again, you see, insufficient information provides negative attitudes. I if we are against whatever assisted dying, that's fine. We don't need to agree everybody. But we, we have to have the good information to work on these attitudes. Attitudes may change through direct experience. I can tell you that the all palliative care national strategy in Switzerland, you know from what it came? From the fact that the sister of our Ministry of Health died of cancer and she was provided with palliative care. Direct experience of what made him think, wow, is there anything in the healthcare system about palliative care? He discovered not, and he made a national <coughs> strategy in 2008. So direct experience may change the attitudes toward the topic. Another way in which attitudes can be changed is by resolving discrepancy between attitudes and behavior. This is very easy. It sounds very theoretical, but it is not. It's actually asking people, why are you doing this? Simple question. Why are you doing this? People should answer. And by answering, they reflect five seconds about why, and then they have to provide a justification. The first justification is to themselves. I do this because I believe it's good. This is the very, the most frequent, <laughs> which is full of good interest, uh, of good um, intention. But if you have insufficient information or you have uh, the wrong information, then you can be sure of providing good care while actually it is not. So asking people why they do something goes back to their values and attitudes, and then we can work on this, because it emerged from the iceberg, you know, the iceberg pyramid. Y you don't, we are not, I always say to my nurses and, and junior doctors, we are not paying for seeing the small corner of the iceberg. We are paid to see what lies under the sea. We mm. are paid for this. We are not paid to see what is visible, okay? So go deep go deep, and go deep is asking, why am I doing this every day? Why are you? These are, this is an incredible work that we should do with mobile palliative care teams, because it's the link between the primary care and us as specialists. We need to be there for them, not only for the patients, because for the patients we are good, that's fine, but we need to be there with the primary care teams, helping them analyze quickly their behavior and going back to their values and value the values and work on this. Change the attitude can come through the persuasion of friends and peers. Talking to peers, and this is an incredible work for mobile teams, is a lot of work in working on attitudes. They may change through legislation. We are seeing this, uh, for example, again, uh, I'm sorry I'm boring <laughs> with this topic of assisted dying, but <laughs> when I will finish my PhD, I will stop doing <laughs> this. <laughs> but uh, um, the, the legislation, there is no legislation in Switzerland about assisted dying. So everybody has an opinion, they are entitled to their opinion, and their opinion is, um, makes a behavior. So we actually have patients uh, that when they are asking assisted dying, depending on the physician or nurse they found, they get it or not. This mm. is not equal. Whatever, whatever is good or bad in a legislation, this is not, mm, is not okay. If you fall into a nurse, uh, you have X care. If you fall into another one, you have a different one. And this is uh, legislation. But then when you have a legislation, then people change attitudes. Uh, you have a systematic review, for example, that says uh, that by providing assisted dying in the Netherlands, uh, they have changed some attitudes of nurses about this and then of the public. I'm not telling you and I don't want to discuss if this is good or bad but actually a legislation has an impact on the attitudes. Mm -hmm. And again 
it's the membership group and the reference group. And this goes back in education, for example, for a college, providing a system of education gives the attention and the capacity to reflect upon the attitudes on certain topics and then modify them. All this can be done with this confidence cycle. You know, when I show this to nurses, they all annuire, um, make yes, make yes with the head is not. not. Okay. When you, I show this to physicians, they close their eyes and say, "What's <laughs> written there?" Okay. This is the. This is uh, <laughs> learning together. You know this very well. Remember that other professions don't even know what this it is. Gibbs circle, whatever circle, other professions don't even know. They are not taught this. We had not been taught. So again, by helping peers and colleagues, uh, an environment of saying, why did you do this? You see? Why did you do this? Do it, see what happened, and then go back. So simple. It looks so simple, but in the busy days, uh, in the busy days, uh, this is a rich practice. But we need to find spaces for this uh, because by con we just do, do, and we don't assess. We just do, do, do because we are busy. We stay there. We stay there. We see teams. Uh, doing so much but never had the chance and i think that p mobile palliative care teams are a powerful very powerful because we stop people for a moment we really in the words we go in hospital words and we say you have done this really good but why <laughs> why w what's the result on the patient have you seen that this has a, a had an improvement on the patient, provided any improvement or not. Uh, and then it, it takes really five, ten minutes uh, in a mobile team. Uh, then we can do in a lecture, we can do in a course, we can do in a portfolio of education. But this provides the fact that I can justify what I'm doing and this is uh, the, the benefit of then being sure about what I do. And finally, the new competencies for new clinical scenarios. I think this is also a crucial point. Why? Why? Because we have an aging population. I think this applies to, uh, to Ireland also, but uh, Switzerland is, uh, is uh, they call it uh, demographic uh, mm, emergency. Mm. Because uh, we know that by 20 to 40 years, uh, we will have uh, a huge number of people, I think Jane <laughs> will, <laughs> will tell us more about, so uh, I, l I, I let her do this uh, much better than I do. But this is, a, it's not a problem, okay, it's a, a challenge and it's an important uh, reflection for us as educators, the multimorbidity. People will not be 40 and just have cancer. People will be 90 with a lot of illnesses and a lot of burden. It's not just, uh, you know, stupid issues, stupid health issues, uh, small problems. Uh, they will have three major illnesses, heart failure, cancer, and frailty, for example. And they will have syndromes. They will not have illnesses. They will have syndromes. Uh, so that's a very big challenge for us to teach about this uh, and the disability then so we will have to reflect upon upon how we develop models of delivery i will i will show you after i don't know in ireland but in switzerland we have such low rate of home deaths uh, versus institutional deaths uh, people can't die home even if uh, when asked but when they are healthy they ask for a he home death uh, actually in my canton region, 14% are the deaths that happen outside nursing home and hospitals. Uh, and in that 14 is included car accidents. Uh, so actually home deaths uh, for uh, chronic illness is much lower than 40%. And this is, uh, a, a it's not only epidemiological stuff, but it's also education stuff. Uh, because 
these are teams, uh, these are different teams uh, in different settings with different educational needs. The missed and delayed referrals, uh, this is the problem of integrated models of palliative care and integrated education of palliative care and early palliative care. Then we have these incredible, incredible issues about migrants and refugees. I don't know Ireland, but I know Italy, I know Germany, I know uh, Switzerland. We have incredible raising numbers of migrants and refugees. And again, here a really short post uh, on the ARPC blog, just to make the president some publicity Thank <laughs> you. of the ARPC blog. Go there, it's nice. Um, about dying home and what are the challenges of migrants' needs in a palliative care setting. And this is uh, not only a care emergency, but it's also an educational emergency because we need to know what we are doing. And the concept of balancing hope and uncertainty because uh, it's easy to be able in doing prognostication in cancer. Are we good enough in COPD? Don't know, don't think so. Are we good enough uh, in elderly care? It's easy to say, well, after 90, will you be surprised if, he, if the surprise question is uh, positive? It's, it's stupid, w nobody will be surprised, but are we really capable to change our plans in terms of this? These are challenges. This is easy, you see, uh, this is the very old uh, trajectory that we know of, for example, lung cancer, people are good, they do their treatments and then they have a recurrence, uh, they are good and bad, good and bad, but then they die. So it's easy. When do we start palliative care? We can discuss here or here. We can discuss, but it's two point of discussion. If we go, um, and uh, sorry, it's a point of discussion, but again, this is, uh, for example, the Bruera model. So we can do, uh, he, it's his model, he says, uh, with cancer, it works very well. Cancer treatments, uh, then we have the symptom distress all together, bring it in a box, uh, and then this is the very best model of care for oncology. Good or bad, it works. This also works because they have a comfort at the beginning, few comfort care, then much more focused care, disease focus. Then, you know, it, there is an inversion, the psychosocial, spiritual support, that follow up, easy. Easy, we know this very well, it's 30 <coughs> years uh, that we do this, uh, now we know. Now let's move uh, to the challenges. For example, the function, I think Jane will talk about this, organ failure, dementia, these are totally different, you see totally different curves uh, of uh, um, of trajectory, illness trajectory. Does the Bruera model, this model of delivery work for this? Our experience says no. <laughs> I don't know, I really, <laughs> but doesn't work. So we have to let people develop new models of palliative care delivery and then educate people on these models. Uh, we can't just copy and paste the oncological model, but by doing this, we need to have models, test the models in research, and then educate people. And we have, I think we are in prehistorical ages, at least uh, in uh, Switzerland or Italy to this. Uh, you see, for example, these are, uh, this is a model for dementia. They, they just stop with curative and palliative care jump. They have stopped this kind of, but they say, okay, we, we have a cure seeking care, but we provide but right from the beginning a diagnosis all this, mm -hmm. which is, uh, this is uh, translated into two, ver two, two words, integrated and early palliative care. So we need to educate uh, in undergraduate setting, in postgraduate setting, these models of care. But this is also an attitude. Calling the palliative care team right at the diagnosis is an attitude, is not only knowledge, is attitude. So we need to go back to that. In conclusion, Einstein said, if you can't uh, explain it simply, you don't understand well enough. <coughs> this is the very best uh, simple that I found. <laughs> um, 
if you see what is integrating teaching, you see you have different teaching styles, but then you have a curriculum strategy, then you have to work on values and attitudes, uh, and you have to be careful about the learning styles of people. So this is uh, the simply <laughs> model, the simple model of uh, education, but we need to be aware of all this. Uh, we need to be aware of all this. Uh, we need to build education in terms of a uh, plan integrated into pre-grad, post-grad to face uh, the challenges that we talked uh, about. In conclusion, come to Bern, I need to make some uh, publicity. EAPC <laughs> in Bern, very nice, uh, very expensive city. <laughs> <laughs> Rent yeah. a flat on, B and on Airbnb, that will be a good decision. And, uh, um, and uh, this is my challenge for my oh, yeah. learning. <laughs> it's, uh, gosh, I, I, I'm not be able, uh, Michael help me. Is, uh, uh, happy St. Patrick's Day because uh, you have a, a, an upcoming weekend for your St. Patrick's uh, and it's uh, La Fel Podro Podri Sona Durik. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody have any questions for Claudia? The, 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 what, what we noted in the, the preliminary findings and, and it will be reported um, in our findings was that the, the more senior the, the physician who would answer the questionnaire, the more negative the attitude toward palliative. And, and, and that's, that seems to be the, the norm when you look at, at, at studies of physicians over a period of time and look at attitude, is that the attitude changes negatively the longer you're in the profession. Um, It'll be interesting to see what it comes to when we, when we replicate with the nursing students and we're just starting data collection with that. Anybody, uh, any question for Claudia? I suppose what, the comment on the competences from, from Switzerland is that um, the length of time it took is probably because you had four different languages to work in as well. Yes, uh, Four different official languages. Um, we were lucky we only had English to, do, to, do, to, to work with, but you have... Um, the four official languages of, of Switzerland to work in, so it's yeah. quite a comprehensive document. It's also the fact that uh, uh, education, um, all that work has been done in voluntary time, so we had no money for the competency book, mm -hmm. like we are developing now the core competency um, for primary, and uh, I'm leading the group, and uh, there is no money actually. Mm -hmm. So um, by not giving money, funding to these projects, uh, it's all upon voluntary base, uh, shoulders of people. Um, and I, I have a positive attitude, but <laughs> <laughs> I still have a <laughs> So um, it, takes a, yeah. it takes a lot of time also because this, it doesn't engage uh, that much people. Yeah. And, so, and, that's the, that, and that's the problem when, when we're doing it voluntarily outside of our work, it does exactly. it's just slow it's, uh, process. Outside clinical work and all this stuff for everybody. Absolutely. Does, so. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you to you.